So welcome everybody. So I'm joined by one of the most influential women in tech, a pioneer who is globally recognized for her work in building a better internet. Now, Mitchell Baker is CEO and chairman of the Mozilla Foundation and as such strives to ensure that the internet remains a public resource that is open and accessible to all. Now, as well as being CEO and chairman of the Mozilla Foundation, Mitchell Baker is, maybe in a lesser way, but chief lizard wrangler. And that's something we're going to find out about later because it's intriguing. So welcome, Mitchell Baker, to our in conversation here at UNCTAD eWeek in Geneva. Now, I don't know if you guys know, but Mozilla blew out 25 candles on its cake just earlier this year. And, you know, I know that your commitment to keeping people safe online, make the internet a healthy place, has been part of your DNA from the world go. But the world is a very different place than it was back in the 90s. So how has that commitment changed to adapt to the very fast moving pace of today? Yes. Well, thank you. First of all, it's wonderful to be here. Uh, we're very you know, excited to be 25 years old. Uh, and actually, that 25 years is the very beginning of the Internet. And so sometimes I'll say Mozilla is the oldest thing online. And I mean that almost literally. And so Maybe. there's some legacy to that. And also our understanding of the world is pretty deep. Uh, but of course, the past is not today. Yeah. And so there's a very active process of what is it from the past that is still relevant, is still who we are and why we are, and what from the past is something we should leave behind. And so we have a manifesto, and it sets out some qualities that we think are important in internet life. And so safety and security mm -hmm. is one of them, obviously, but it also goes deeper and it talks a little bit more about individuals and how much impact and influence do we have on our own lives, which I think of it as human dignity, versus how much do products act on us, you know, or try to manipulate us. You know, that's, that's in our manifesto. And what are the effect of technology on the human psyche? Yeah. You know, is it outrage or are we trying to build something healthy? Uh, and so those are all things that we think should carry forward. And then there's some technical architectural pieces about interoperability and standards and mm. open source, which we view as the technical foundations for how you actually make something trustworthy as well as encourage competition and allow small and medium and new players to come in. So encourage innovation and really allow the parts of the globe that are coming you know, to fruition mm. now to have more opportunity. So our manifesto continues forward. Those are the traits we're looking for in online life that we try to build in our products and build in the world and represent ourselves. And isn't that incredible that you have this manifesto and that these values that you embedded 25 years ago are probably more relevant today than they were back then. That, you know, when yes. we say you're a visionary, I think that kind of displays a bit of kind of visionary and pioneering kind of, kind of I don't know, foreseeing of what we're going to face today. Well, thank you. First of all, I, I appreciate that. I will say today the browser is not as central to people's understanding mm. you know, of online life, and we use apps a lot more. But uh, it's an unusual piece of software in that it is like the front end for a lot of internet architecture and a lot of technologies. And so because we've been in that space for so long, since the beginning, actually the very first thing people ever used to get online was a browser that Mozilla comes from, um, we've had the luxury of seeing what we would call the technology stack, you know, from the protocols that the machines speak to each other yeah. all the way up to the things that you and I do. And so it's both our luxury, but maybe our job or responsibility as activists in the technology space to try and look forward and see what these impacts are. And, and I think it's utterly incredible. Now, as I was saying in our introduction, we're here at eWeek in Geneva and, yeah. and the throng is behind us and there's lots of meetings and panels taking place. and. While we've been here, we've heard a lot about making digital much more trustworthy. We've been hearing about 
making the digital space more sustainable, more inclusive. And then so from what I'm hearing and from, from you, what I've been hearing from you know what's happening behind me here at eWeek, how aligned are your values to those of those of the UN? Oh, I think they're pretty closely aligned. You started with the statement, the internet is a global public resource, mm -hmm. open and accessible to all. That's the first line of our manifesto. So that is the core of the Mozilla identity. And Mozilla is a technology provider, and we, we compete with Google and Apple mm -hmm. in our products and Microsoft, uh, but we are a nonprofit yeah. at our heart. Um, we run a business uh, as a tool to the mission, which is you know, an internet that is a global public resource. So we're open source, which many are, but we're a step beyond that. We're a public benefit organization. And so I think those things are quite closely aligned. That's so interesting. And a lot of the discussions here, particularly today, are going to be on artificial intelligence. Yes. And that is obviously the big topic at the moment. Um, we don't, and tell me if I'm wrong, but I don't think we understand the full power of AI and generative AI. And it seems to be uh, a dialogue of extremes. On the one hand, yes. technology that can save us, another, it can wipe us out. Where do you stand? A few things. I, I should say I don't have all the answers either. But I'll say my starting point is I think we don't understand where AI will take us. And we're not going to understand where, I will, where AI will take us. In the first you know, creation of the steam engine or the powered loom, mm -hmm. did not understand where the industrial revolution would take us. Uh, and I think the beginnings of the internet did not understand where we're going to go. And so there's a set of changes that I mean literally are unimaginable to us. Uh, and I think they range from the things we're looking at now to some questions about what does it mean to be human, mm -hmm. You know, historically we've said, well, humans use tools and humans have language, right? Sometimes people say humans have a soul, but certainly language now is not unique to humans. Yeah. I mean, we know some animals have language as well, but uh, the AIs will be more proficient in the human languages, you yeah. know, than, than we can imagine. So everything from what does it mean to be human, uh, all, all the way down to the practical consequences. So I don't think it's possible right now to imagine or to regulate for all of the things that AI could be or mm. could do. Uh, I do think it's important, though, to take the steps now of the things that we do understand. And we've learned a lot from social media. We've learned, like, waiting too long is not good. Yeah. And we've got some basic things. So understandability, or more mm. technically, or observability, yeah. um, but we talk a great deal about openness and transparency in other systems. And so that bedrock of society should be able to understand what's happening. Yeah. We can't really have a voice either as consumers or as government and regulators if we don't understand. So there's, a, I think, a regulation about what is actually happening, how do we understand it. Um, we know that there's flaws in the data sets. Mm. So we can address a set of questions there. Uh, and I think we need to be looking at what are the use cases. You know, there's lots of questions about, do we regulate the liability? Uh, and there, like, it's not that the technology itself will be good or bad. It's how do we actually use it? How do we understand it? Okay, so I, I'd like to pick up on two things yeah. you were just saying then. So initially you were just kind of, you know, explaining we don't know where this yeah. is gonna go. So at a personal level, how does it make you feel? Oh, I feel humans are wildly adaptable. And that in most cases, we'll adapt and be human. I, I mean, I really do think, especially if you're a woman, imagine you're in the 1300s. Like, what was your life like? You probably didn't leave your village. You know, something 15 miles away was probably unimaginable. What was a city? Right. And, and so you go from that to the life of you know, billions of people today. Mm -hmm. It is completely unimaginable. Or, uh, and so our cultures, our understanding, our worldview, the integration of you know, religion and science into life is unimaginable in that era, but they were human, we're human. So I think the human species is just wildly adaptable and societies will change. Uh, I, I think the you know, expression of what's the right of an individual vis-a-vis -vis society or the state, which we would categorize today as democracy, mm -hmm. you know, has one set. You know. 
um, or, or authoritarianism. Or, you know, there's yeah. a range of them. I, I think all of that's going to change, too. Uh, and, and that our institutions will, will change dramatically, just as they have in the last 500 years. But we're no less human. We're not really that different than people 500 or 1,000 years ago. But, and, and that is, I suppose, based on the premise that humans will still be around, because some yes. people are saying that AI actually poses an existential yes. threat. Yes, I guess that. Well, let, let's break down existential for one. There's the AIs go rogue and wipe out humanity as a species. That's the furthest one. Then there's a few back, like what does it mean to be human? So um, I think if you're in that camp, then you, you would be, we're gonna do, we're gonna try and stop this technology in all its forms. I think we'll be tough, <laughs> drive it underground, but maybe it won't be um, as extensive. Mm. It won't be integrated into normal life in the same way. Uh, but I, I think the best chance of addressing that is to be learning and engaging as, you know, as we go forward. Yeah, so that's, if that's not a possibility you necessarily entertain. Well, in the theoretical, could it happen? Is it the thing that like keeps me up mm -hmm. most day to day? No, my concerns are much more practical. I mean, we know today the data sets are biased. Mm -hmm. We know that all our historical isms, racism, sexism, misogyny, violence, is all encoded in these yeah. systems. We know that things that used to be illegal discrimination are now biased in these systems. Like these, these are harms that we spent, you know, a fair amount of recent history t trying to understand and undo, uh, and we're bringing them right back, you know, and then trying to address them after that. That's a real harm today. Yeah. We, we you know, so uh, I, I think if it's really an, if you're really focused on the existential threat, then you're trying to shut it down, right? But, but, but I also think that learning and understanding and addressing the harms today, through, is it observable? Like, that's a key one. If it's going to go rogue, like, we probably don't know what's happening. So, uh, like, investing in research. Mm. Like, if you're trying to be first in market, you know, trying to build a market cap, the research in, well, how would we understand it? What were we doing? What are the control mechanisms? Mm. That's not the thing you're most interested in, right? And that's not where the focus is right now. So we're looking at things like observability. Does it have to be a black box? What can we do? So and that's the question. Does it have to be a black box? Because it is up until now. So is it yeah. going to be in, we were, you know, the other point I was going to ask you about was this issue of regulation. Yeah. And I think a lot of those questions that you've just brought up now in terms of that internal bias, which yeah. is likely to be very much augmented and kind of exacerbate divides that already exist, is embedded in the system already. So there's going to be some backtracking required in terms of that regulation when you have a system that is moving so fast that it seems difficult to see how you can actually kind of catch it on the move and regulate. So, so how would you see the regulation taking yeah. place to try, I suppose, yeah, respond to some of these biases, but other issues that need to be dealt with? And do you think, sorry, a double barreled question, yeah. observability, of AI systems is a realistic possibility? Well, I'll start with the latter, and I'll mm. say I think we don't know, because that is not, uh, you know, that, that requires, that, that's a computer science problem, yeah. and computer science problems require research and time and activity and focus and financing and, you know, compute resources to, to understand these things, and that hasn't been the focus of the industry in the last, we'll say, 18 months. Mm. So I do think that part of the response, including maybe it's regulation, but maybe it's financing and proactive activity, is how far can we get with mm. observability? We can't answer that now because we don't have the data and we, we don't have the amount of focus on trying to answer that question that we need. And does that need regulation so that the primary commercial players have to engage in some way? It, it very well might. Mm. Uh, on the larger question of regulation and where does it go, I think that that depends a, a bit on the kind of will of society, right? because you could have very extreme reactions. Mm. Like these data sets were pulled from the web, so it's a theory that you want to pull in all the information mm. and then train. You want the widest possible starting point, yeah. and then you're going to train and tune from that. Like that's a philosophical piece. Um, it means you've got all this terrible stuff in it. Yeah. Uh, and you're going to rely on your ability to understand it and filter it out. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you, you know, you might have different approaches 
Uh, and so I could imagine, you know, very extreme regulation saying, no, <laughs> you know, we don't want that approach. Um, but you'd have to then be willing to set the state back a bit. Yeah. I think you'd have to be willing to be a region that wasn't using some sets of very modern pieces. So short of that, I think certainly in this, what are the training sets? What's the data? How do we deal with the harms that we know mm. are embedded in these data sets? You are playing catch up. Yeah. Uh, and, and so I think there's some pieces of where and how. And I, I think that that's probably best tuned to the use cases and what are people doing with it. Not so much the creation of it. Yeah. Uh, I think when you limit creation, you're going to limit innovation and competition and probably help centralize. I think it's yeah. pretty centralized right now. Uh, but what are the uses especially I think commercial uses, mm -hmm. you know, are places where we would limit, like product liability is a, you know, an area that obviously people are looking at that has a fair amount of precedence for what can happen. And then what would you say to the issue, and we will move on from AI, but it really is the topic yeah. that we're all trying to understand at the moment, the element of misinformation, because we've talked about bias yep. being embedded, but the element of misinformation has the potential politically, geopolitically, to wreak havoc. Yes. How would you, who know this landscape so well, yeah. kind of foresee that playing out? Oh, as I said, I think massive amounts of change are coming. Mm -hmm. um, what thing that we we need, which we don't actually have yet, are the you know, right now, these new technologies, it was true of social media, it's true of AI currently, mm -hmm. they're highly centralized technologies, which are aimed at us. <laughs> um, you know, we can use AI, you know, you, you build your prompts and your prompt systems, mm -hmm. and, and, and certainly you'll use it, but the system's quite highly centralized and is gathering all of your information mm -hmm. from that and then redistributing it, you know, quite broadly. And so that's very different than the power of this technology, like firmly anchored in who am I and what do I need and how do I engage with the world? You might call those personal AIs. Um, and there are lots of organizations, including Mozilla, looking mm. at and thinking about and trying to develop such yeah. things, um, which would be much more focused on what's my either information or data, what are I trying to accomplish? So I, I think that's a very important part of it, um, but it does not reduce the fragmentation. Mm -hmm. I think that there'll be a, a plethora of different AI systems out there. Each of us will probably use a range of them for different topics. Yeah. Uh, and that, uh, you know, the ability to have well-constructed, totally false information sets is really going way, way up. Uh, and so thus I see the need for these personal agents that help us. You'll have to make a choice at some point, uh, but we do already. You, you choose what information sources you listen to or what used to be broadcast. Mm. There used to be newspapers and TV broadcasts or what networks do you listen to? Um, increasingly, what social media channels yeah. do you think are legit? So we're already making those choices uh, and we'll be making those with various AI or AI enabled systems as well. And so again, the observability, but the ability to have that power in a system that is its purpose and its product is to help me <laughs> engage with the world outward from me is really going to be critical. And that's, uh, you asked earlier about Mozilla shifting. And mm. so, you know, that's an area that we're increasingly engaged with um, as well. Okay, and, and it, it's absolutely vital. Um, our conversation is fascinating. I, I keep wanting to come back to things I'm thinking yeah. about. And I just want to come back to this issue of gender. Yes. Um, because there was a report, the 2023 World Economic Forum Gender Gap Report. Um, has said that female representation in artificial intelligence is approximately at 30%. So that's not representative, obviously. Um, with AI development now in full swing, yeah. can you translate for us what that discrepancy, and this is just, we're talking about gender, but what that discrepancy means in terms of the systems that are developed? Well, this may sound terrible, but I would say 30%, you know, in technology mm. is, on, is on the high side, not the low side, right? Uh, I would say, though, that that 30% is probably not well, much, much lower in actual 
decision making. Yeah. Right. What you know, and certainly if you look at what happened at OpenAI. Oh, that yeah. was going to be my next right, question. Right, right. Yeah. Well, let's, so uh, let's talk about right. that after. Yeah. So, so there are a few things that we know. We know that diverse groups and diverse perspectives mm -hmm. make long term better decisions. Mm -hmm. There's clear research on that. So, so we know that the AI space is not benefiting from that in its leadership space. Um, we know that um, someone's made a decision some sets of people, right, that all of the terrible information online, misinformation, mm -hmm. disinformation, violence, instructions to violence, you know, how to engage in violence, all of those things are valid as part of the new systems. And then mm -hmm. we'll train them out afterwards as we understand them. Maybe that's right. You know, from mm -hmm. a computer science piece, it's got a lot of concerns. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so uh, I, I think being in a, in a group that faces less of those concerns and making those decisions, you know, you, you have a different focus. Yeah. Uh, and maybe, like I'm trying to play devil's advocate with yeah. myself a little bit, maybe you'd say, well, the system would go slower. It wouldn't be as general purpose. You know, maybe some groups of society will say, well, that's okay. The goal yeah. is not to go as fast as possible. The goal is to build something that's healthy and decent. I, yeah. So, um, but it is product development, you know, the more constraints you put on it, it does slow down. I, I do want to be clear. We try mm -hmm. to develop product. And if you, um, there is just an immense power in trying to build a product that does something. <laughs> uh, uh, and, you know, Silicon Valley is very good at building global products. And so, like, it, it's hard. And so I, I also want to recognize that the more constraints you put on something, the harder it is to develop product. So it might be slower. Maybe you'd never get it at all. I mean, mm. I, I, I'm less of that view, obviously, than most of the big tech companies. But even in trying to build product, it's hard. Yeah. <laughs> it's a really hard thing. And so I do think there is some truth in the fact that like the more constraints you put on before you build or the more evaluations, it, it really does get hard to move forward. Um, so, but I, I think more diverse groups would make different choices and we'd have a little more information about those things. Yeah, they, they would make very different choices. And on that point, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but seven more than 71% of leadership roles at the Mozilla Foundation are staffed by women. And... Uh, you know, I'm not sure of the exact number. Yeah, you know, but, I'll grab but, this off but, your website. Okay, but it's, uh, uh, it's high. But it's high. Yeah. Yeah, it's high. And it's very high. And um, more than half of leadership roles also come from people from different ethnic backgrounds. So there's an intersectionality yes. there. Yes. So you were just saying that, you know, having diverse teams can make a difference in terms of that development. Yeah. So surely you've already provided the answer to one of the issues we're talking about when it comes to this inherent ah, bias ah. that is being built into the system. Ah, well, two things. Two, yeah, so we've made a real focus on enabling and recognizing and rewarding talent across a wide range of demographics. Mm. But, you know, um, gender and intersectionality being high you know, among them. Uh, and so there is real talent. Mm. The flip side, here's one of the ways that Mozilla is trying to change. And now I'll go back to one of your earlier questions, too. We are a very value-based organization with our mission. And I think we have had periods of time where we've been so focused on our values, it has made us hard for us to develop product. It's made us hard. We've gotten, we've paralyzed ourselves mm. a little bit. Because you can't make a perfect product. That I believe, because you yeah. don't. If it's really successful, it's going to be used in ways you didn't imagine. So you, you can't make a perfect product. Um, and very often, even when we can design something we think is kind of close to perfect, mm. it might be inconvenient. People don't like it. The market doesn't want it. It's a very hard piece to get something that is. Uh, I call it the art of product. You have to look at. We think we can make the world better by doing X, Y, and Z, and. This is what the market is ready to adopt right now for one reason or another. Like, that's not to criticize consumers. We're making a whole range of decisions. And so that art of getting a product that can be successful, and in our case, moves our mission forward, yeah. is very hard. Uh, and so I don't think we have all the answers to that. And that was my little bit of hesitation. Mm. Like, we have great talent. And a, a lot of them, you know, uh, uh, as you say, uh, have 
uh, different demographics mm. than others. Uh, and the real key for us is that that art of product and I think trying to move things forward, not be perfect. Yeah, that, that, that I think has really slowed us down. So seeking perfection isn't necessarily always the answer. Now, I, I, I'd like to move, and we discussed open AI, well, you mentioned open AI. Yeah. And so the new board was announced earlier this month after Sam Altman was reinstated. We've all yes. seen it in the papers uh, endlessly. And it's an all male board. It's an all white board, <laughs> it might be had. So no intersectionality there at all. And some say that this is the return of the big tech boys club, uh, a movement in Silicon Valley, which is becoming decidedly anti-woke and pushing back against ideologies of inclusivity, of diversity, a, a lot of the values that are at the core of the Mozilla Foundation. What do you say, first of all, about this board? And secondly, about this movement? Well, it was certainly a chaotic week at OpenAI mm. in crisis. Uh, and I've experienced my own crises and they are chaotic and, mm. and trying to get to some form of stability is not easy. So I want to acknowledge all of that. You know, coming out of their original decision to, you know, and, and getting the org back to some stable piece is hard work. Mm. <laughs> and so, you know, they, they managed it. Uh, and, and it really is hard. Uh, so that's a context, and I want to acknowledge the mm -hmm. difficulties of doing something like that, and you know, multiple personalities, and all the things that went into getting a, an organization that was functioning again. Uh, so, but that said, like we know that diverse perspectives both give better answers and also take into account the experience of more of us. Mm. And so there's no question that in all, you know, the board that you described is not the board that our research tells us is like going to have good understanding or interest or respect or good results for big chunks of humanity. Like that's what the research is. Now, sometimes you get individual people who are so phenomenal that they can be the exception. Mm. And so maybe open AI, an open AI really, um, you know, we'll make the case that their board members are so exceptional that they're at the far edge and they're going to be able to build a system that's actually good for more of humanity, despite, you know, the research on their mm. demographic makeup. Um, but, you know, that's not an argument I'd want to be making, but maybe, maybe they'll make that argument. And what about this? movement that some describe of anti-wokeism? Ah. Yeah. Well, I'm going to be direct. I want to, I'm going to stay away from like the labeling and, mm. and, and, and the words um, and say that like social change is hard uh, and it, it goes in waves and you get backlashes. And, and so I think there's also research that a lot of DE&I programs are cut, and a lot of the mm. people who are leading those are leaving, and that um, it's just certainly easier to go back to the way that you know and that's successful for you, <laughs> and certainly doesn't require you to change your 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 mm. methods. Um, and I think we're seeing that across you know a range of industries, mm. but but you do see you know technology is is still um, the leadership is really limited gender wise, so. Um, I, I, it's a distressing piece. We're, we're not like we're committed to it, but mm. you can certainly see that there's a backlash. So let's move the conversation along because we've been talking a lot about AI, the implications yeah. of AI, a lot of the difficulties in terms of inclusion. When we look at innovation, yes, and the positive aspects of innovation, what's getting you excited right now? Well, I'll say open source in mm. AI. Uh, has gotten us excited because I'll, I'll, I'll go back and give you know a little bit of history if I might here in the early so Mozilla was a uh, early in the open source movement we didn't create it mm -hmm. but we were part of it and Firefox was the first consumer product that was open source uh, the conventional wisdom was it was only for geeks right and so when Firefox was being developed and came into the mainstream it was the first time 
open source hat. And so I personally like did hundreds of interviews about open source, collaboration, mm -hmm. share. I mean, this was before anything. Uh, and a, one of the things is it really enables more participation by more people. It levels the playing field and it allows people who aren't the elites or don't have all the wealth or don't have mm -hmm. the right, right educational degrees to actually participate and to be able to demonstrate what, what can I do? Uh, and so we're very interested in open source in AI uh, and, and how the open source principles and world translates to new things in AI. But, but uh, we've already seen since the release of Firefox, uh, Firefox, sorry, uh, Meta's <laughs> models, you know, intentional or leaked, you know, whatever, but, but the re release of focus on a range of things, in particular, how to make LLMs more accessible mm -hmm. to more people. How to run them on smaller devices. Can you run them on your laptop? Can you run them on a phone? Like crazy progress, mm -hmm. like day by day, week by week progress and how to make this more accessible for all of us. Uh, you know, how to reduce the resource needs, um, how to tune, how to make things personal. And so I, I'm excited by that because I think that is a piece that enables lots of innovation but also by a much broader set of people and organizations globally. And so then this makes me think of your title, and correct me uh, if I'm wrong, of uh, Chief Lizard Wrangler, because was that not a role where you tried to kind of work with this community, this yes. open community? What's happened to that position? Yes. First, I'll explain a little bit. The Mozilla logo is... Uh, Dino, really, it's a dinosaur. Um, but sometimes it looks like a lizard. And people have described it as a lizard and we've had a series of gecko and sort of mm -hmm. such things. And so the lizard in there really sort of refers to the dino and Mozilla. Uh, but you, you're, you're quite right that the, that title was chosen, I chose it, mm -hmm. or, or created to represent an open source community that was very different than a set of employees. And so to represent a leadership role, or the leadership role actually, but without many of the tools of management. And that form of leadership is very different. Mm -hmm. Like management, your salary, your career, your family stability, you know, that's a lot of um, influence or power over an individual in directing them towards certain outcomes. And if you take all of those away and you have a set of volunteers, which is what Mozilla was created out of, who are spending their own time and energy to build things they want, like that, I like that form of leadership because I think it, it trains message, goal, mm -hmm. direction, framework. It trains empowerment. It trains a level people have to understand. You know, the employee is like, well, I don't get it, but this is my job. I'm going to go fulfill my goals and do what someone tells me to. Um, it's a little bit different, you know, when you're choosing to do that at home. And so there's a, a clarity of mission. There's a need for empowerment of people. And there's a belief that, you know, people can actually um, generate new ideas and help you form strategy over a yeah. much broader basis. And so it, it was is a reflection of that. And Mozilla has gone in waves from um, like the volunteer community is really massive and builds what it used to be 50, 60 percent of in those days Firefox, you know, to, to sometimes it is lower. Um, and so the, like that, that, that piece has really varied over time. Uh, and recently we've been very focused on the how do you build new products that represent our values and move forward but aren't aiming for perfection. And that's a much less uh, a community focused piece. So do you miss so, that role? Oh, I do. I do. Partly because most people in the world will not go to top tier schools, mm -hmm. just by definition, by percentage wise. Um, most women are not going to get the opportunities that their male counterparts do yet, especially globally. You know. Um, and most people are not going to have high-powered job titles at a few great centralized companies. So if your opportunity is based on that, like it's a very small number of people. But open source, today it's a convenience. You go 
GitHub. I mean, you go some, you, you grab some code, you use it. But the movement that made it powerful was about freedom, empowerment, participation, level playing field, that you can actually engage and learn, but also show like what you can do quite separate from all of these very limiting factors. And I do love that. And so, well, and finally, let, I just want to close our conversation off by, okay, we began by discussing the fact that you celebrated 25 years. Yeah. People see you as a visionary and you've certainly proved that. So when you get to celebrating those next 50 years. Now you've talked about this yeah. unknown, but can you try and articulate that unknown for us? What do you imagine life to be like in 2073? <laughs> All right, I will say that I think the data flows are immense. Again, in ways we don't quite understand. We're you know, used to smart doorbells now, mm -hmm. but but your shoes, these tables, these chairs can all be smart. They can all be generating data about us. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you've been injured. Is your posture right? Your chair, your shoe will tell you that, right? We're not doing those things now, but they're all possible. So I, I think the data flows will be huge. The dystopian version is that 100% of that is sent to, you know, some organization um, or that the conversations in your house that the various smart devices are picking up are also catalog, index, mm. monitored, and sold. Right? That's all quite possible. So that, that's the dystopian version. Um, I think the chance we're heading towards dystopia is real. Mm. Uh, thus Mozilla and, and why we keep at it. But, but, but I am, I think, an op, you know, optimist at heart. So it, uh, let me paint a slightly different picture, which is where because we're further along with AI and understanding like what could happen than we were with social media, that, that we do have uh, enough regulation early on, really focused on learning and understanding so that we can innovate better, uh, that we have created a set of uh, really personal AIs that help us, um, that our understanding of what we do with this uh, called misinformation, harmful disinformation, what is provenance, how is it generated, uh, that we have tools. I, I think it's going to be there. It's not going to go away, mm -hmm. but that the tools to respond to it, understand it, and provenance are in products that were available to us. Um, uh, I would love to see a world in which there were more organizations like Mozilla. Like we're a technology, we are technologists at our core, uh, but activists in technology and its impact on the world. We can do it because we're a nonprofit. Uh, that's a hard way to compete. So I, I think there's some form of corporate structure and development so that there would be more organizations mm. that can be like us and, and funded, <laughs> you know, to, to try and build products in a, in a slightly separate way. Uh, and that uh, this kind of innovation, we've, 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 let's hope in the next 25 years, we move away from there's only one solution and it's global, you know, to a, more of the promise of what open source brought about empowerment, so I would say moving the promise of open source, which does allow individuals to do more, um, and adding a little more understanding and experience in business, <laughs> and maybe the politics that go along with the power of technology, so that those underlying principles have more impact and get institutionalized in more organizations than, say, Mozilla. Thank you so much. And I would just My ask, finally, have you got a quick message for everybody who's watching us now, maybe, I don't know, a final thought or something you'd like people to do? Well, I'd say first, don't give up. It's really easy to either products are great. I'm not going to think about any of this or it's also scary like, whoa. Um, uh, so I would say don't give up. Definitely engage. Uh, technology can be intimidating, but don't don't let it intimidate you. Like we're all human. We're smart. We've incorporated technology before. Uh, and then speak up, really engage and speak up. What a great way to end our conversation. Thanks so much, My it's pleasure. been an absolute pleasure. Likewise.